and welcome to a new episode of the Computomics podcast. I'm very excited for our guests today and we'll introduce them now. They are a plant breeder by education and an organizational talent by heart. They've delivered engaging solutions across projects and facilitations in the public and private sector. This includes work in the pre-breeding and fusarium resistance of hybrid rye for breeder KWS and program managing the wheat initiative. Today, they work as a breeding expert at Computomics. Alisa Ziba, I'm so glad to have you here today. Hi there. Alisa, um, you have a PhD in agricultural science. Which are the main crops that you've worked with? So I'm a cereal nerd. I really like wheat, like not wheat, wheat. <laughs> uh, and my PhD focused on durum. Um, it's like a quite important um, crop for the Swabians among us because you make the um, semolina out of it. So to get really good spätzle. <laughs> So, so you would say that it was maybe your love for Spätzle that brought you even into that field? It was more by accident, but when I think longer about it, uh, it, it must be. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, you've worked for KWS, a, a breeder. Um, maybe can you just uh, tell me a little bit what kind of work did you do at, at KWS? So I was responsible for the breed breeding sector. So. If you have your normal regular breeding program where you um, cross your parents, then you find the best ones and you um, develop them to an actual variety. This takes about seven to 10 years and then some more years for um, registration. Um, but due to the whole breeding um, progress and process, um, sometimes you lose um, diversity or when you're looking for a specific trait, um, this might be not uh, um, visible in the current breeding pool. So you have to bring in new material. This is done by land races or wild varieties. But to make them work for the conventional breeding program, you need to do this pre-breeding, like making them, like it's like kindergarten, make, bringing them into the school. And when they done their high school, they're ready to go into the the. Um, um, conventional breeding program and this was like my task to to be the kindergartner and um, my focus was on like general earliness and fusarium headlights so looking out if there's like potential material that improves the resistance so rye has looked like it has some resistance but it's more not sure if it's just an escape mechanism so because it's really tall compared to wheat um, yeah, we were looking for if there's a like real um, resistance in, in diverse biodiverse material. Mm -hmm. And I love that image of, of the kindergartner you know, <laughs> trying to, to, to get all those seeds together and, and make them do, you know, what, what's good for them and maybe, you know, for them as, as grown people, <laughs> if, we, <laughs> if we continue the analogy. Um, but what, what was, would you say was the toughest part about that work? Uh, I, I would assume, you know, like a real kindergartner sometimes, you know, has to t deal with some, ki some kids being sick or, or they all want to do different things and go in different directions. What were your rye kindergartner challenges? <laughs> uh so actually to get them like everyone out of bed uh so since the material was so diverse we got them from like um, a genetic gene bank uh like seed gene bank but the material was all over the world so everyone started growing at a different time and to do for example the amphisarium trials where we have to uh, spray the fungi over the plants to test like actually in um see if they get sick or not um it has to do like we have to do this at a specific time and since not everyone is like getting out of bed um, at the same time it's really hard to find the right time and actually see if everything is growing at all or um, some need more treatments um, this was uh, always exciting to say <laughs> if it really worked out to find a good one then mm -hmm. And um, how would you say, I mean, I can already hear that you were maybe experimenting a little bit with different approaches. Um, how would you say, did you foster in a way innovation within the, the breeding program? Um, so since breeding is 
always the same and never the same at the same time. Um, so you do the same steps every year, but due to weather, um, environment, needs different like the needs also uh, changes over the years um you always have to adjust and adapt um so it's always some kind of something new and um yeah research uh, um like it's uh, it's still r and d um um and we're always looking for a new and better solution so this is already exciting and um something that yes that uh that has a, that has a home in breeding, so it's something. It's already there. Mm -hmm. And can you give an example? Maybe if you if you think back, I know it's been a couple of years now, <laughs> but um, but if you think back at that time, you know when you had to make such an adjustment, can you can you give us an example of that? Yeah. So again, it's the fusarium trials. So there have been already fusarium trials, uh, but I had a really good um, teacher during university who was. Uh, He's really experienced uh, in in um, fusarium breeding. It's um, uh, yeah, and he showed me actually how to do the trials. Um, and I try to bring this in, and it's something new. And in conventional or like in in commercial breeding programs, um, it's different compared to to like university breeding, since uh, everything needs a rhythm because in the end you need to harvest the seeds to sell them and. Uh, to bring in this new idea, they all liked it, but you change the system. Like there's a new trial, there's uh, like a new how to evaluate everything. And it was a lot of um, going from person to person and convincing. And But in the end, if you show um, willingness to help, uh, they've been all on board. And after getting this um, done, um, the trials went really successful, successfully. So it's it's more a people job <laughs> at, to like to introduce new um, trials or new ideas to convince them. I, I get that. I have a people job too. <laughs> um, it's it's a lot of the work is is really about that, like you know, spreading information, uh, making sure everyone understands what it's about and how it relates to their work and their goals, uh, and then you can uh, work together as, as a team much better. Yeah, so communication is a is a big part, or ha must have been a huge part of um, another step, another milestone in your career. You were a program manager at the the Wheat Initiative. Maybe a bit of context, um, and do correct me if I if I uh, if I say it wrongly. But um, as far as I understand, the Wheat Initiative is an organization that's coordinating global wheat research. Um, it was created in 2011 following the endorsement of the G20 Agriculture Ministries and seeks to provide, I guess, a kind of a framework to uh, establish strategic research and organization priorities for wheat research at an international level. Um, and that includes both developing and um, developed countries um, and includes also, a, I read, funding or the attempt to, to secure funding for that research. So I, I would summarize it maybe as, um, or, or maybe you can tell me, could it be said that the Wheat Initiative is a, almost an NGO for wheat research and policymaking? Uh, quite well summarized. Um... Just just a quick note. Uh, we say global north and global south instead of developed and developing countries. Um, Thank you. Welcome. Um, yeah. So wheat um, again. It's some kind in my in my uh, curriculum uh, is one of the most important um, food sources. Um, but for example, compared to maize or corn, um, the R and D. Um, um, investments this is the word i was looking for um are ra quite like relatively low compared to corn um, and maize and the endorsement like the idea of the endorsement was to really push um read research like in the focus then um why it is so important um um to yeah actually um the overall goal to um secure the uh, food in 2050 so it was, um, and, and the idea behind the We Need initiative is to speak to the researchers, see where their needs are, um, summarize them through our initiative and bring them to the policymakers. So we had the working groups of researchers and we had the policymakers in um, some kind of 
um, yeah, bored. Uh, and so it was relatively easy to get um, there some kind of workflow and um, yeah, to to let the policymaker what what we what the researchers need to um, improve the, the the research. And if if I if to, to go to a little more detail on that, um, I'd be interested in in how exactly that conversation that exchange with researchers and also I guess representatives of industry the wheat, uh, the wheat industry or, or production how how did that work on a, on a daily basis how could they get their needs heard or how would you ask them um it was less on a daily basis it was more like on um workshops um projects um workshops where we um, supported the, the working groups. Like we had, for example, a breeding working group or a um, drought resistance um, working group and so on. Um, and in their workshops, they had um, academic researchers, um, researchers from the industry. Um, it was a lot of networking, bringing the right people together. And out of those workshops, they um, formulated the problem and potential solutions. Um, and also discussing what is needed. Um, and through this, um, they either brought the ideas to the um, secretary where I was working or um, through us or directly, because some researchers um, from the working groups also been in this um, research, research scientific board where we have representatives of the um, of researchers or research institutes and um of the industry. So it was always one part not from academia and one from um, private sector. Um, and they um, filtered like, because we have so many uh, needs and working groups, um, filtered out the important information and brought them to the um, representatives of each ministry and of the countries that are in the WEED initiative. And uh if you can recall, I, I know you've you've worked there for almost two years. Uh, in your time there, what was maybe one example of of such a such a need that you formulated together that you found through one of these workshops, and and uh, how did that progress in the country with policymakers? Do you have an example, maybe? Um, it's less uh, planned related, but more um, funding related. So out of um, um, Right in the beginning, we had a really big um, workshop meeting where we actually had all the um, in initiative partners in and the need was to find some kind of fundraising system without in a, within an hour initiative or like the question, how does all the um, fundraising system works? Because on within a country, it can be complicated, but with two countries, it becomes more complicated. If it's you, it's... And, as soon as you outside of the EU, um, it's like almost, <laughs> it's horrible to get all the biocracy uh, in line. Um, so out of the needs, we developed a fundraising working group. Um, they summarized all the funding mechanisms in the countries and offered to support specific groups to um, get funding and um, yeah, explain how, how everything is working. So this was like, a straightforward um, solution out of this workshop. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, sometimes it's really about streamlining the information and then, and then I guess, creating an infrastructure that, that people can use to then uh, once again, get their funding on the, on exactly. the local level. I see. And, and what was your role within that? I mean, we said program manager, but what was your, your role, your, your daily work? What did it consist of? Yeah. So in that special case, it was, um, hearing and bringing the voices together. I'm um, like, um, I, I loved it. Like I always say, I was the communicate, like the communication main center. I'm not sure if it's the right the word. Hub. Uh, overall, it was um, listening to all the different project leaders. Um, it was a lot of networking, um, a lot of um, project management, um, um yeah um developing the workshops together with the um uh, work uh, um working group leaders um going to conferences listening to what other researchers are saying um yeah and mainly like bringing people together again like a people job <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, you, you, I think your background or, or your your academic uh, career was in at the University of Hohenheim, right? In in Germany, Baden-Württemberg, Germany. Um, and I think here uh, you probably have pretty good setup, and people would know about the Weed Initiative. But if if you know, for example, there was a researcher now in uh, in an area that wasn't as well connected, how could they kind of access the those workshops or that that information that the Weed Initiative offers? So there are like two things um, to getting the information and also to be a, um, a member of the Weed Initiative was not for free. Um, so you have to be a pay membership fees. The one thing about information is um, we went on conferences or I actually approached smaller countries um, if they would be interested in joining the Weed Initiative or like not just countries, but also companies. Um, we were figuring out um, a strategy to make it more accessible for also um, countries that or like companies who wouldn't have the financial capacity to be a membership fee. But um, in my time, I was there, um, we couldn't completely um, uh, yeah, implement it. So I'm um, yeah. That's uh, the main thing. Uh, but um, yeah, the, 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 our task was really to approach them from our side and um, show them the advantages for the countries and companies to be part of the um, initiative. Mm -hmm. You did. You did mention earlier uh, the you know the topic of sustainability and also the global impact of of that work. Um, and I think we'd breeding wheat research in, in general. Um, how would you say uh, does plant breeding support the UN Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs for short? Um, as a plant breeder, I always say it's like there's solution at all. But if you talk, for example, to um, uh, someone who's working in plant protection would say uh, only this is the right solution. And um, it's like a mixture of everything um, um you have to constantly um improve the plants because we're like the world population is growing the climate conditions are changing um just uh, um the i read news in the morning where it's like the droughts in several countries are um eliminating the harvest from like to zero um and it's not possible to to feed the people um and finding plants that can survive that harsh conditions or are more resistant um to those quick changes or um for example um have a shorter period for growing um secures food yeah so everything is like so somehow connected and for me as a, a, a plant breeder or as a plant producer um or someone connected with plants at all it's it's the base of everything an un understandable perspective but even even to me as a non non-plant beater it, it's it sounds uh, like it makes sense especially if you do have an openness to other areas of of development and and maybe a shared approach at some point um so one thing I, I read in my research uh, uh, about you is um, uh, that uh, I think it was in an article at Aglad Zeitung that they they covered you. <laughs> um, they they did quote you as saying you you loved the, your work at the Weed Initiatives and organizing and communicating, but you did miss science, uh, like the, the actual like kind of hardcore science, a little bit in that job just because there was so so little time for that. Uh, now that you're the a breeding expert at at Computomics and also do freelance work. Um, um, how how do you balance those areas of both your skills and also um, your vocation? What what you like to do? Um, it's actually like it couldn't work out better. So I'm only part time at Computomics and uh, getting again a little bit nerdy and um, reactivating all the knowledge um, that I learned once in academia and university and. Also working with the analysts is um, a lot of fun. I really miss that. Um, and also like getting back to like the knowledge you actually did as like a practical um, knowledge, um, bringing this in. Um, but since I'm not, like it wasn't my daily job in the last 
five years or so. Um, it's a really nice balance actually to do the project management for uh, my my um, social equity projects or um, like other projects as a freelancer. Um, so it's it's some kind of natural balance. My brain needs somehow, so it's uh, advan uh, advantage for me. <laughs> I totally relate to that. I also need a bit of a change of pace, um, but to also to stay to stay connected. Um, but for for your work at Computomics as a as a breeding expert, what what would that entail? That's where you work with the analysts and you communicate uh, with with project partners. Or can you give us an insight into that? Yeah. So um, it's. Uh, I'm still in the beginning, but my main tasks are like understanding what are the analysts doing and um, what do they need, for example, from the breeder um, and also make them understand what the breeders need or how a breeder thinking. So finding the um, the same language because everyone like in the end, the goal or like everyone is thinking in the same direction, but um, just um, bringing in together the voices um, is like the main thing at the moment. So I'm um, talking to the sales department, to um, talking to the analysts and also understanding um, what the current breeders are needing. And this is like something I'm trying to do in the moment. <laughs> and you seem to be having fun if I, if I, if I read the signals right. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I miss that and I'm happy to have this in my life again. Great. Alisa, thank you so much for, for spending some time with us and giving you giving us an insight into, into your, your work, uh, into understanding a little bit the, the role of wheat um, with regards to the sustainable development, the global sustainable development, but also the nitty gritty daily uh, work um, of communicating uh, with anyone from breeders to analysts. Uh, it was really lovely to talk to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And to everyone out there listening to this episode, thank you for being here. We hope to hear and see you in a way again for our next episode. Uh, meanwhile, feel free to check out our website at computomics.com and hear you next time. <laughs>